Let's see. I have a family, a wife, and a seven-year-old who's going to be seven this weekend. And he's going to be going through the education system, which I did. Uh, I found, and I still find, there's a lot of problems involved in this education sh system as I went through. I am a Calgarian, born and raised here, lived in Acadia, and I grew up through, through the school system from grade 1 to 12. When I graduated, I kind of just hummed and hawed, didn't know what to do, so I became a welder. And after becoming a welder for six years, I thought, well, you know, I'd like to go into computers. So I went into computers. And I want to thank the, the owner, business owner, for supporting me, part-time schooling, uh, work, working my way through a computer program course. Then I got a job at Shell Canada for a year. And then I got a job at Karma Developers, Western Canada's largest, largest land developers, Heartland Homes. And I was in the computer administrative and assistant treasurer for Karma Developers. And I learned a lot about accounting and being in the accounting department. I also realized how the phases go up in, in communities and then the schools come way later. That's interesting. However, I wanted to pursue my computer career, so I worked for EDS for 10 years. And then I thought, well, you know, this is kind of learning the corporate governance and the corporate structures and root causes and, and management pros, procedures. And, and I went through all that for 10 years. So I, I am now currently working at St. Polytech. And I've been here for five years. And I also trade stocks because I enjoy it. And learning balance sheets and spreadsheets and uh, all sorts of things. However, for my life experiences and what I've been through, I feel that it would be a perfect Thank fit for much, me to Stephen. be a trustee. Thank you. All right. Next, we'll move on to Judy Hare. Hi. First of all, I would like to thank Civic Camp. You do an amazing job at organizing these things. And I'm so pleased to be a part of this opportunity. I'd also really like to thank you, though, as the audience, because you are the people that will make the difference. You are the people that I've been able to meet daily as I'm going out door knocking, and thank you so much. And I have a special thank you to Allie. And Allie, if you wouldn't mind standing up. I got to meet her tonight. She's a student from Rideau Park, which is one of the schools I will have the opportunity, if elected, to support. She is running as a school trustee, and tomorrow she gets to know how she's done. So best of luck. Thank you so much. And that truly, for me, validates the importance of public education. So now a little bit about myself. I'm a grandmother and a very proud grandmother of three boys. Marshall is eight, Jackson is six, and uh, Parker is three. Jackson and Marshall attend public school. I'm also one very proud mother of two graduates from public um, schools. And my son is Kent Hare, who is the MLA for Calgary Buffalo. And our daughter is Christy Smith, who is senior legal counsel with TransCanada Pipeline. But my big gift that I believe I bring to the table is that I have been an educator, and I was a teacher and an administrator for 30 years with the Calgary Board of Education. And I am very proud to have been that involved, to have given a life service to, ed, to, t to children. And I look forward to continuing my odyssey in getting involved in the trusteeship. I have three areas that I would like to share with you. Class size is critical to me. The communication that we do with the public, we need to really change that and improve that. And I am really concerned about the dropout rate in the city of Calgary. Thank you very much, Judy. All right. So those candidates with the yellow placards, that's uh, uh, Irina Kuperis, Stephen Ervalt, and Judy Hare. And they're the candidates for Steve Chapman. Steve Chapman. <laughs> No, no, I'm going to the ones, you guys, who just spoke with the yellow. Oh, I'm sorry, you're, <laughs> my mistake. Apologies, Steve. Uh, okay, Steve, would you like to go? <laughs> Can I? <laughs> yes, you may. Hopefully the elector won't be, I won't be quite as forgettable to the electorate. Uh, again, thank you, Civic Camp, and thank you very much for uh, all of you for coming out. Uh, my name is Steve Chapman. I was part of the Calgary Board of Education process when I moved to Calgary and attended Lord Beaverbrook High School. I came from Toronto, but I came before it was fashionable, so I am one of the early pilgrims 
in the uh, area. I've lived in uh, downtown, uh, inner city Calgary, most of my adult life. I was a Calgary police officer for uh, uh, about a dozen years. My, my last position, it, while a police officer working in Dover, working in uh, the inner city, I mean, schools are part of that community. Schools are very much part of the inner city community, very much part of our communities. And that's not necessarily always appreciated. My last position in the police department was working on youth gangs and youth crime. And I became appalled at the emerging youth problem that we were starting to have in Calgary, and that really there was no, nothing on the, on the ground floor that was dealing with it. I submitted a proposal to the Calgary Police Service uh, to, to create a task force that, that combined police work, uh, the police department, uh, parents, uh, schools, and communities in terms of how do we resolve that so we don't experience the same problems that Vancouver, Seattle, uh, and the Western Seaboard had, with, uh, particularly with youth gangs. And it was turned down. And the, the party line at that particular point was gangs don't exist in Calgary. Uh, so I quit. I quit the police department. I ran for alderman on a, on a position of our kids are in danger and we need to do something about it. I came in second in that campaign. And uh, about 60 days later, we had a new policy on youth and youth crime in the city of Calgary. Uh, of course, when I try to get my job back, they just laughed. <laughs> so you burn a couple of bridges, but you get results. And that's what I'm bringing to the table is I get results. Uh, my big focus is ensuring that, uh, uh, that you really control the resources and you get the resources to where it's needed most to kids in classes. Thank, Thank you, you, Steve. All right, so let me try this once again. Now I have my color recognition down. Huh. Okay, so the candidates for wards eight and nine are Irina Kupiris, Stephen Irvald, Judy Hare, and Steve Chapman. Thank you very much. Okay, next I will go on to um, Misty Hamill. Hi, I'm Misty Hamill. I'm running in wards six and seven. I have a three-year-old son who will, in two short years, be in kindergarten in the public system. And I am looking forward to creating positive and exciting dialogue between students, parents, and educators in a productive manner. Um, I have been very encouraged speaking to people already in the last three weeks um, about what is happening in our system. And um, I think in order to move forward together, we need a fresh perspective. And I'm looking forward to being a part of that fresh perspective. Thank you very much, Misty. Trina? Thanks, Jeff. I'm happy to see so many people here taking the time to become informed on their trustee candidates. I've talked with thousands of people about our public schools in Calgary over the past few months. It has been so encouraging to hear time and time again of the high value people express for public education in our schools. We have great schools in Calgary. We have great teachers, great school staff, great parents, and great community partners who are all focused on making our schools the best they can be. Now it's time to elect a great board of trustees. We need great trustees who understand that they are responsible for how over a billion dollars in funding is allocated every year. Currently, the public has no idea where money is being spent, as the budget that trustees approved only breaks that billion dollars into six line items. When teaching and support staff positions are being cut, class sizes are ballooning, trustees need to be absolutely certain that as much funding as possible is being directed towards where it will have the greatest impact in our schools and classrooms. I have worked in financial administration and have a strong working knowledge of financial statements and statistical analysis, and I am prepared to provide for effective financial oversight of our tax dollars to ensure that they are being spent for the benefit of our students. However, while financial oversight is essential, trustees need to be focused on students and education. As a former teacher and an engaged citizen who has recently completed a master's in educational technology, I'm familiar with the latest research in education and the current provincial initiatives that are focused around transforming our education system. However, as a mother and volunteer who has a strong community connection, I recognize that we need to be working very closely with school staff, parents, and students before making changes. There have been far too many top-down initiatives, with the proposed new report cards being the most recent example. Thank you, Trina. Oh, sorry. 
All right, next we'll have George Lane. Thank you. I'm a strong believer in the value of a quality ed education for everyone. It is every child's birthright and every adult's responsibility to ensure it is readily available. For the individual, education is a great equalizer. It shows people, it allows people to progress in life because of what they know, not because of who they know. For society, education is a great multiplier. It makes democracy possible, it makes the economy productive, and it makes for a rich culture and a civil society. The world of education has been good to me. I've taught in an elementary school, a technical institute, and three different universities. And I have been an administrator in each. My career has included entrepreneurial experience, board governance experience, and consulting experience. I come from a generation that believes in giving back. It has been said that one's giving back to the community should draw upon one's interest and qualifications. I believe mine match the needs of a $1.2 billion corporation uh, serving 110,000 students in a community of 1.2 million people. Thank you very much, George. So once again, uh, those were the candidates for me for Ward 6 and 7, and that was Misty Hamill, Trina Herdman, and George Lane. All right, so we'll go into the citizen selected questions right now. Uh, so just a reminder, you have a mid and 30 seconds to answer these. I'll choose two people randomly to answer each question. Uh, if you do choose to rebut, as you see, you all have poker chips in front of you. And uh, if you wish to answer a question for which you weren't asked, please show your poker chip, put it in the thing, and you can answer it in the order in which poker chips are presented after the original answers have completed their, completed their answers. All right, so the first question will go to Stephen and Misty. Uh, and that question is, would you support a policy that gives siblings first priority in schools that must use a lottery for admittance? Why or why not? Stephen? No, I would not support that. Um, I feel that this would divide children, maybe one going to another school and such. And being in a hockey parent, I know that there's parents with two kids playing hockey, and one has to play the same game, same time in another area. So if this happens, one kid goes to another school, another one goes to another school, well, there's no family unit involved. There's no, you know, I go to this school, and we go up together, and we have the same experiences. It's, it's different. So that's my platform on that. Thanks. Thank you, Stephen. Misty? Can I just verify the question was, would I support a policy that gives siblings first priority? Yes, that's yes. correct. Why and why not? Yes. So I would support a policy that gives siblings first priority. Uh, I think it's very important that we keep our families together. Uh, it's, I, I, I think everybody supports this. Um, it's less transportation costs. It makes uh, logistics easier for parents so that they can get their kids to the same school. Uh, it's a built-in support system if you have an older sibling already going to the school. Um, so yes, I would support this policy. All right, thank you very much, Misty. All right, we'll move on to the next question then. The next question goes to Judy and George. That question is, what could the school board do to address schools with not enough students and communities with no schools? Judy? I can tell you from personal experience that that indeed is a tough, tough thing to have to face. I was the principal at Renfrew Elementary, and while I was there, they started the LEAP process because we were looking at a closure of a school. Prior to that, we did everything that we could, and I'm going to encourage all of you to think outside the box when it comes to any of these decisions. We had looked at putting in a before and after school care program. We had looked at, and we did, we regrouped the school. We were able to design it with K to three students in one school, and we bussed the four to nine students to Colonel McLeod. We were able to individualize the program, and we took in outside communities. So literally, as a community, we did the absolute best we could. 
and yet the numbers just weren't there because other schools were opening. And so when you're looking at a closure, it is really difficult. When you're looking at the opening of a new school, it is also something that needs to be addressed and we need to have parents from day one get involved in that process. And I believe that all schools should have uh, schools in their community. Thank you very much, Judy. George? Thank you. As, as Judy has said, it is a very difficult problem. And um, the, the one good thing about this is in the long run, we know that schools do go through cycles. And uh, well, they may uh, have lower enrollments for a period. Uh, the, the turnover in the community will, a few years later, probably uh, replenish some of those, uh, some of those places. But after about three generations, it kind of levels out, and, and then you really have problems. And the kinds of things that uh, are typically done are to look for an alternative program that might uh, be added to that school, or there might be uh, uh, some rejigging of the, uh, of the uh, grades with an adjacent school. Uh, but it, in the final analysis, uh, it may be that the, that the students from that school might have to be transferred to another school. And uh, that's kind of one of those unfortunate things because everybody likes to live near a school that they can walk to. The difference is if we, if we also believe in choice, and people in this community certainly do, then that sometimes makes it a little difficult to have that many schools. Thank you very much, George. <clears throat> Trina? Well, the Calgary Board of Education has already said that they will not be closing schools for at least 10 years because we have a massive school shortage. We have far too many children, even in our inner city schools. I've been talking with a lot of residents in Ward 7, Rosedale, Hillhurst. They're all bursting at the seams. We do not have to worry about closing our inner city schools at this point. What we do have to worry is about building new schools for all of these students. Within the next five years, the City of Calgary is projecting 110,000 new suburban residents, and those people have kids, and they need to get to school. We need to start working with the city. We need to start working with the province. We need to start working with developers to get these schools built. Jeff Johnson wrote a letter to the school board a few months ago, basically saying, you know what, you have to make it easier for the province to build schools. And you have to do that through developing partnerships. And that's what we need to start doing. Thanks. Thank you, Trina. All right, the next question will go to Pamela and Steve Chapman. That question is, recent budget constraints have challenged fine arts education programs. What steps would you, t would you take to address this need? Pamela? So it is my belief and observation that recent budget constraints have put pr extreme pressures on our school system in many areas, not just the arts. Um, I know in my work, before I was a trustee, parents fundraise relentlessly to support artists and residents programs, to get music instruments, to get kids, give kids the opportunity to attend cultural events and be part of the community. And so for me, the bigger question is, how can we actually define, redefine what is a basic education? We're funded for a basic education and it will vary. People's definition of what that is varies from person to person. Some think it's just the math and the science and the, the basic fundamentals of learning and critical thinking and that, but others believe art and music and all of that stuff is critical to ensure that our students are successful going forward. So for me, it's more about redefining what is a basic education and then ensuring that the province is going to fund us for what our community expects out of our public education system. Thank you very much, Pamela. Steve? Part of the issue, as, uh, as was just mentioned, was what exactly is the education? Is it really just a reading, arithmetic, uh, math, uh, 
uh, I guess math would be arithmetic, but uh, in terms of an education, and I would go back to a personal experience, uh, you know, when I went through grade 10, I was actually on the cusp of being a really bad kid. Uh, alcoholic parents, moving every six months for the previous, my whole school year. Lord Beaverbrook was my 18th school when I hit grade 10. Um, and I was not necessarily in good place. And then I got into the music program and met a man by the name of uh, Jim Shields. And uh, that actually changed my life in terms of the people I hung up with, uh, what I was involved with, and what I was doing. And instead of probably going down one road, I became a police officer four years later. Uh, arts and programs like that are integral to the development of our kids. And I think we have to start having a recognition of that, both at the provincial level and as parents. I mean, we start talking about what really is, because these are the cultural development uh, years of our children. I mean, that whole 15 to 18. And we start earlier. We start, because if kids start to have a positive experience in grade school and in elementary school, they start to have a better experience when they hit high school, and they start to have even a better experience going on to post-secondary. So it becomes part of making education accessible and fun. Thank you very much, Steve. The next question goes to Larry and Irina. Do you believe it is important to have more board members with education backgrounds? Larry. First of all, uh, it, it is important to have some of that, um, but we have a lot of people in the administration that have a, a lot of uh, credentials as far as uh, education is concerned, and, and those are the people we need to lean on and ask the questions and, and get those answers. I think it's important to have a really variety, big variety of backgrounds, different diverse backgrounds from business, finance, communication, as well as education. I think we need to reflect what our community is and represent what our community is. And to just have educators there is not going to reflect what it is that, that the people want. So we have to have that balance on the Board of Trustees. I think that's very important. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Irina? I'm going to say no because I am not a teacher and not a principal. Um, balance, absolutely. Um, there's nothing wrong with that, having multiple perspectives. Um, but I'd like to remind you that the Board of Trustees has a duty to educate our children. Um, and the Board of Trustees um, are their elected officials. So they really need to represent the parents um, and other taxpayers, perhaps, that have an interest in education. And so to not be biased, um, maybe some of the trustees need to come from other backgrounds than um, the school system. Steve? The Calgary School Board has the duty of educating our children. The Board of Trustees has the duty to ensure that the resources are available for that process to happen. They are the people who have to watch the budget, they have to deal with the provincial government, and more importantly, I think over the next uh, decade is work better with City, City of Calgary Council as to how our land use developments are going and how transportation routes are going, because these, education is not isolated. Uh, personally, uh, one of the experiences that we had uh, recently at City Council was the uh, police commission basically banned any uh, members of the Calgary Police Service from actually sitting on the police commission. And the reason for that was they brought bias to, to that particular board. And the police commission felt that what they needed was open eyes and people who were willing to talk to the rank and file who were in the organization at that particular time. Um, again, not sure if it's the right decision, and I don't think it's necessary. I think that was a little extreme. But I think it's important that the trustees start to look at the bottom line and that they actually talk to the teachers and principals and administrators who are currently working the system. Thank you, Steve. Judy? So I obviously need to speak to this because I am the administrator teacher who's trying to get on the board. So I think it's pretty incumbent upon me to make some comments. Uh, I come with a doctoral degree, and the reason I think it's so important is when you have experience, 
it is absolutely just the best resource, and all of you know that. When you're out there, no matter what you do, you rely on your background information. You rely on those experiences. And that is the gift that I know I can bring to this board. I have a career of 30 years. I've been a kindergarten teacher. I've been a principal. I've had the opportunity to work with special needs students. I've had the opportunity to mentor and to foster strong, strong connections with parents. Parents are critical in our work. And without that in background, I, I look at it and I say to myself, wow, what an uphill battle it would be for other people. Not that they won't do a great job, but what a gift I bring to the board. Thank you, Judy. All right, we have one more question to finish this round before uh, we'll have a 15 minute intermission. And that question will go to Trina and <coughs> Steve. Uh, all right, this question we had a bit of a debate on. Uh, it doesn't directly fall into the jurisdiction of trustees, but it is an issue that people might, voters might be interested on your opinions are, as you are in a position to advocate on it. Uh, and also, we want to respect the, the votes of the citizens who presented these questions. So that question is, do you favor taxpayer support for charter or religiously based schools? Why or why not? Trina? As you mentioned, Jeff, this does not fall within the jurisdiction of school board trustees, but I think it is a discussion that, as a province, we are going to be having over the next decade. It is an issue that many people are concerned about, and we need to be out there talking and find out what people want for this. If you want to know my personal opinion, I believe that charter schools were created with the ideal that they would be centers of innovation, and that they are there so that they can be doing the latest research, the latest thing, and then the public school boards are supposed to learn from them. And in that, they would play a very valuable role. However, I'm not sure if charter schools are necessarily fulfilling that role at the moment. And I would like to see going forward, charter schools being a lot more innovative and public schools working a lot more closely with them to learn from their successes. Thank you, Trina. Steve? The question actually came up uh, yesterday at, uh, at the door of one of the people who was having an issue with uh, the charter school, so I had to do a little bit more research. Uh, it is an experiment. Uh, it is a, it's an issue of choice. And you know the concept of charter schools has come to the point where uh, it was a different type of educational process or a different type of focus that parents wanted their children to have. And really, that becomes a fundamental uh, basis of, of our education policy, which is parental choice on how their children are being educated. Um, whether charter schools are going to succeed in that particular area or not, I don't know. But I believe that the fact we have them increases the overall mosaic of our education process and our education uh, system. And as, uh, as Trina mentioned, we learn from that process, and I think it can make the public education system better. However, uh, the question was, do we agree in taxpayer support for that? And I'd have to say yes, because we have a responsibility to fund our children's education. And if we have a system that is appointed and, and, and vetted through the school, uh, school Act, then that money must follow the child. We have that commitment, that responsibility as, as both citizens and Albertans. Now, I, I say on my website, education isn't so much a right, it's a responsibility and investment in the future of our province. Thank you very much, Steve. Larry? Thanks, Jeff. I think it's really important to, to make the point as well that we as the Board of Trustees, we as citizens in Calgary, and we as uh, people who work in the system, whether it's teachers or administrators, need to make public education the best option for people. We need to make it the best it can possibly be. We need to take our, our point of view and focus laser-like to, get, make, to make sure that it is the absolute best option so that we can show everybody that it is the best option and uh, whether the uh, government decides to fund uh, other schools or not is up to them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Larry. 
All right, we'll take a 10 minute intermission now, start back at 05. If you have any uh, questions you'd like to ask in the second half, please submit them either at the front with Wendy or at the back there. Thank you very much. Could I ask everyone to return to their seats and we'll begin the second half of the forum. back everyone so we'll we'll continue for one more round of uh, user voice crowdsource questions uh, and then we'll move on to the how round so the first question after intermission goes to Misty and Arena uh, that question is what is the biggest challenge facing the Calgary Board of Education and what would you do about it? Uh, once again, I'll remind you, you have a minute and 30 seconds to answer and rebuttals have a minute. And, um, Misty. Um, I think the biggest challenge is a shift in perspective towards the Calgary Board of Education. Right now in Calgary, we have um, a very vibrant and, po and positive community force um, we witnessed it in the last 100 plus days uh, that the power of community, uh, when we are excited and proud of our community, can sustain us and can shape us and can bring us through devastation. And I think that the Calgary Board of Education has um, been lacking in that positive support. There's always gonna be need for change and improvements in an organization that's as large as the Calgary Board of Education. Uh, but there are so many things that are great that are happening. Um, the IRIS program, which is a fantastic technology program that the, uh, the, the, the board has developed and has been given awards for. Um, our provincial achievements that have been uh, better than the rest of the province. Um, and I think it's very important that we celebrate those achievements. And I think a shift in perspective is not only um, going to be a good thing, but I think it's very necessary in order to new, move forward. Thank you very much, Misty. Irina? Try the question. Was it um, the challenge facing the Board of Education? What is the biggest challenge facing the Calgary Board of Education, and what would you do about it? I draw a very big distinction between the Board of Trustees and the Calgary Board of Education because who delivers your education to your children is the Calgary Board of Education. But the Board of Trustees is this pack of seven at the top who are supposed to um, ensure that that education is delivered according to how you want it delivered. Having said that, I think the biggest issue with the Board of Trustees is trust. Um, and that is probably why people send their schools to char uh, people send their children to charter schools and even Catholic schools when their children are not in fact Catholic. Um, with the the, um, the administration itself and the delivery branch of this organization, I think geography is our biggest challenge. We have no schools where we need them. Uh, children spend so much time on the bus trying to get somewhere and by the time they get there they're tired and exhausted and they're not really you know conducive of receiving any education so those are the two challenges thank you very much Irina all right 
The next question goes to, oh, sorry, George. Thank you. I wouldn't have said this two or three days ago, but I think the, uh, the biggest challenge facing the, the trustees part of the Board of Education is pretty apparent. And that is that uh, we are going to have to recruit and select a new chief executive officer, a new chief superintendent, um, and uh, she's going to have big shoes, she or he will have big shoes to fill because the Calgary Board of Education has made tremendous progress in the last few years in the, uh, in the words of the British Prime Minister, you know, it's the best in the English-speaking world. Uh, according to OECD studies, we're about fourth in the world. And uh, so we're on a pretty good path, and we have to ensure that we continue on that path. Thank you very much, George. Anyone else? All right, the next question will go to George and Larry. And that is, what will you do to ensure the school board trustees' decisions are more transparent? Larry? Thanks very much. It's actually, it's actually a pretty short answer. I mean, we need to celebrate public debate. We need to have less private meetings. And we need full disclosure of details in the budget. We need to make all of those things public. We need to encourage people to come to our meetings and share their views and have meetings at 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock rather than 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And we have to engage the public and, and show them that we want to listen and care about what they have to say about their education system. Nice, short, easy answer. Those three things are, are really important. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. George? Thank you. The... Uh, you know, when it says, when it says, what will you do to ensure the school board trustee decisions are more transparent? Well, more transparent than what? Name me a school board that is more transparent than the Calgary Board of Education. When you talk about, when you talk about budget, for example, people say there was five lines in, in, the, in the budget. But what people should be looking at is the process for the budget, which involved a... Uh, an initial statement of budget assumptions, which was about 30 pages, and then another 30 pages of the budget itself, uh, put forward in two or three different formats. And uh, I think that, yes, we could, we could advertise on the radio that there's going to be school, school board meetings on a particular night. I think most people know that. It's always posted on the website. And... Uh, a few people do come to the website, I think more that uh, come to the uh, board meetings. I think that there are probably more than that to follow it on the webcasting. Um, so it's, it's a pretty transparent system as systems go. And uh, for example, when we, when we uh, post expenses, I don't think there's any other school board in the province that's doing that. We aren't required to do that. but. And they aren't required to do it, but we do it. Thank you very much, George. I just ask that the audience refrain from interrupting the candidates when they're speaking, please. Uh, sorry, who put a chip in? Irina. That's right. Time to toot my own horn. Um, for a living, what I do is I analyze people's requirements and I determine the root cause of the issues that they complain about. So I'm not against transparency. Uh, I'm all for transparency. And I kind of side with George Lane that the board really has been somewhat transparent because there hasn't been any, there hasn't been that much to talk about. The board of trustees is left out of the process of how the superintendent creates the budget. And how can they be transparent? any more than they are. The report card fiasco, as some people say, is a perfect example of that. The Board of Trustees had no idea that this was going on. Why? Because the processes that we have within CBE do not include the Board of Trustees. The Board of Trustees has removed itself as 
a, a, as a player of any kind of role whatsoever within the processes that the administration Thank and the County Board Arena. of Education is performing. All right, the next question goes to Pamela and Trina. Oh, sorry, one more poker chip from Stephen. Yeah, I do agree. There is transparency. However, to find it, you've got to go to a website, and who knows when the next uh, meetings. And also, uh, they're at 3 o'clock. Now, who gets off work at 3 o'clock or earlier? What parent gets out of school? children's school out of 3 o'clock. So if you want to physically go down there and voice your concern, it's kind of difficult, maybe after hours. However, it is transparent. There is a website, but it's not known. People don't know. My sister works for the school. She doesn't know about the website and when the, when the next meeting is, but she has to drill and look for it. Perhaps it has to be broadcast out to the public or communities. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Anyone else? Nope. All right, the next question goes to Pamela and Trina. That question is, what should be done to increase public citizen parent access to Board of Trustee meetings and deliberations? Pamela. Thank you. So one of the things I'm hearing is that the time of the meeting is problematic um, for some folks. Uh, for others, it's not. Uh, our meetings are live streamed and they are archived. So anybody can go back and look at what uh, had happened. One of the reasons for changing the time to three o'clock in the afternoon is because they weren't well attended when they were later. And to be respectful of people's time and staff that are there early in the morning and board meetings had a tendency to go on till 10 o'clock at night. So part of it was to be respectful of the people that are actually attending the meeting. One of the things I did in the recent board meeting was uh, bring forward a recommendation for an establishment of a committee to look at the community engagement piece. The current board of trustees uh, did quite a bit of work this year in engaging citizens. We've held meetings with thought leaders and community leaders, business leaders. We conducted five area meetings with parents. We created the Council of School Councils. So this board was very committed to being able to engage citizens in conversations about the deliberations and what's going on at the board. Thank you very much, Pamela. Trina? I am very glad that the Board of Trustees is live streaming their meetings now because I had to go down and actually videotape their meetings for a year after they voted against doing it. So I would go down to every single board meeting and videotape it and put it up on a website for everyone to see. And then lo and behold, a year later, they suddenly decided, oh, we can do it now too, <laughs> which was very convenient. So I am really glad that they are live streaming their meetings because I do think that that makes it a lot more accessible. The timing of the meetings is very problematic for parents. Um, if they wanted to move it earlier during the day, probably over the lunch hour would be even be more convenient for parents or for people that work downtown to attend. Also for engaging parents and even teachers or our other official stakeholders. We have an official stakeholders table in the Calgary Board of Education meetings. And it's the union representatives and a parent representative. But however, they just sit there during the entire meetings. They're never invited to participate. They are never allowed to say anything unless they go through the process that any member of the public has. Well, if we have official stakeholders, we should be listening to them and they should be allowed to speak to any agenda item for a certain amount of time. Thank you very much, Trina. Right. So the final question of uh, the last of the user or the citizen selected questions goes to uh, Stephen and Judy. Uh, and that question is, class sizes have ballooned, kids are stressed, we are a successful province, what can you do to improve the, cl the school class format? Stephen? Again, um, this is an interesting question. For me, in my situation, I'm going to be moving my son to Acadia School. I checked and uh, they have good classroom sizes, apparently 19 in a grade two. I thought that's incredible. And I checked Fairview too, and it's fairly low. So. Looking at a bigger picture, it's Calgary's growth pains here, and working for a developer, 
I can understand them putting us a lot for schools. However, that takes two or three years. And for us to grow so fast, so many people coming into this community and their children, I, I, it's hard to keep up. So then you go to busing. Well, here we have to bus people to these schools that have room, and no schools have community or no communities have schools, so they have to be bused to and fro. Um, apparently, that's basically the growth pains of Calgary, and uh, to accept it or make it better is 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 a way uh, busing, and maybe looking at other schools to see where there's availability. Thanks. Thank you very much, Stephen. Judy? So as you know, when I started, I said to you that class size was the number one issue for me. And it has been since the day I started teaching. The fewer students that any teacher can work with, the more impactful your instruction will be. So what do we do about that? Well, I think initially what you will see in schools, and I'm so proud of all my colleagues, we will group and regroup students and try every possible way of getting our class sizes smaller. The problem comes is right now, we do not see a willingness on behalf of the Alberta government, from my point of view, to fund education so that these numbers can go down. So what do we do about that? Well, if I'm elected, I think I need to work with the broader public. And that means I need to work with the MLAs who do have direct influence on the finances and where those finances go and come to schools. And I think I need to look at all the partnerships across our city. Because there's not a group of people, especially not a parent, who doesn't believe that if they can have smaller class sizes for their children, they would understand the impact that has. You cannot think that in our city, when you increase the number of students, and you know that just by population increase, and then you decrease the number of teachers, that you're not going to have a problem. And that is evident today. Thank you very much, Judy. Stephen? Just to add a little bit more to this, um, one of the big problems of overcrowding is, you know, they put them in portables, or the big thing I've never heard of was split classes. Apparently, they'll split a grade one and grade two in the same class. Now, my question is, how is this teacher going to give value to an hour period when it's only half an hour that she's jumping back and forth? Now, this is all fine. You get an assistant, but however, I've been talking to some people in different wards and apparently um, they don't get an assistant so this teacher is not only stressed jumping back and forth but how does the how do you get full value out of this one period you're actually only getting half so that's a problem and I believe that we should have more support for those teachers in split classes thank you very much Stephen Judy so I'm going to take the opportunity to answer that for you Stephen when you have split classes, we will look at grouping students, and when we do split classes, we recognize that there will be strengths, and these teachers are so amazing. When you're looking at mathematics and you're looking at language arts, it is absolutely very simple to meet the individual needs of students. The problem sometimes comes in that we group our uh, curriculum, so we will say to ourselves, one year we're going to teach grade two curriculum because we'll have our grade one and two students. The next year we'll teach grade one curriculum. So really the talent within a school and the teachers, that is so amazing that it is really easy to do. Thank you very much, Judy. <laughs> All right, yeah. I have to use them judiciously. <laughs> uh, Steve. Class size obviously is a, a growing concern. It, it's been very uh, vocal in the media. We've had letters written from kids, uh, you know, complaining about it. I've had some experience uh, in, in part of my school travels. I was in Regina uh, for a short period of time. I took, I think, grade, the last part of grade four and the beginning part of grade five. And grade four, five, and six were all in one class. There was six students in my grade. And uh, it becomes a very interesting choice in terms of split teaching when you, you've got 20 kids in the room, but they're in three different grades. When I was doing my doctoral work, uh, I also had the opportunity to teach at uh, 
at the university uh, to a class of 400 students on introductory psychology. At the same time, I taught at Mount Royal uh, to uh, 22. And I taught at Old Sun College out at Galician to eight. And I can tell you very clearly that the quality of education increases dramatically when you can have a one-to-one -one relationship. And that will require better budgeting. It's going to require better fiscal responsibility of trustees. And Thank we're going to have to start looking Steve. at how we assess our resources. Rena? I want to touch this one because I don't have a solution. And I will admit this. Um, so we, we know that people want this. However, I'm not even certain if it really is an issue. Uh, there are countries out there who have large class sizes. Their education doesn't suffer. Um, to the budget issue, 16 billion or something like that is Alberta Health Services budget. Our budget is 1.2. If we were to go to the province and ask for more money, they might give it to us next year. What do you think will happen the following year? Alberta Health Services is going to start crying, and that money is going to go back there. So I don't think that this is a sustainable solution. Um, we need to look for other uh, creative solutions on this one. Um, not just keep regurgitating that it is an issue, but let's find out what really is the root cause here and what is the true objective that people want to reach. Maybe the class sizes is really not something we should be uh, looking at at all. Thank you very much, Irina. George? The, the, the business of class size is uh, kind of a moving target. And uh, most people believe that smaller classes are better. That's not always the case. Sometimes you, at, at least at, in the, some of the classes that I've organized, you try to get a right kind of mixture, and you probably want a, a particular um, critical mass. And so it's a very complex thing. Part of the problem, of course, for our principals and so on today is even in, in some of the large classes, they might want to split them or, or put, split one into two, so on. They don't always have the space or the teachers or, the, or other resources and equipment and so on that may be necessary. In terms of uh, additional dollars, my estimate of uh, where we're at on that is that uh, we're, the CDE is underfunded by about 16% relative to other boards of our size. And uh, we need to work on that. Thank you, George. All right. So that ends our uh, citizen-selected questions. The next round is a how round. So what I've done is I've gone to the candidate website or looked at their literature or talked to them before the event tonight and picked a point on each platform. And I'm going to ask each of the candidates how quickly how they're going to implement uh, that piece of their platform. Uh, so this is kind of a lightning round. They only have 30 seconds to answer. You cannot use your poker chips in this round. Uh, so it's just a straight 30 second answers. Uh, so we'll begin. So Steve, Steve, you've stated that this academic year, our school system will face a $300 million shortfall while accommodating 3,000 more children in the system. We have already seen classroom overcrowding and fee increases that parents must bear. This problem is not going to go away and is not more being properly planned for. How would you improve this? Probably one of the first things is we have to start getting the money that we are due. I mean, I was shocked uh, that the city or the province gave $52 million of education money back to the city of Calgary uh, when that money was earmarked for our education fund. And you go, okay, why is money that was actually earmarked and, and raised for education when we do have shortfalls not being uh, properly dispersed within the budget? So I mean, the first part is let's get the money that we actually have due to us uh, and get it into the system so that we can start dealing with uh, not having a $13 million shortfall uh, at the beginning of a year. Thank you, Steve. Misty, you've stated, finding ways to work together will set a positive example for our children while ensuring that they are well equipped with the tools they need now and in the future. How will you do that? Um, I think that it's very important to involve our community with conversations that are positive and constructive, and that will serve as an example to our students how they can work together in school and in their lives ahead. Um, and 
I think that that is going to involve some new and innovative ways, which will involve uh, coffee shops, pop-ups where you can chat, will inv involve surveys, uh, a parent just recommended survey monkey going out for report card uh, assessments. Thank you, Misty. Judy, you've stated that older schools require maintenance, repair, or modernization need to have these issues addressed promptly. How would you like to see that done? Once again, the first thing I think, whoever is elected, we need to look at the present budget. And we need to decide if all the money has truly been spent and if it's been spent for the best resources. And when you look at the budget, there is uh, a 13% that goes into um, looking for modernization. And so we're going to need to look at that. Then from there, I think we're going to have to be as creative as possible. And I am as open to, to reasons and ways to fund and come up with funding sources. Thank you, Judy. Trina, you've said that you found that there wasn't adequate planning going on, there wasn't an acknowledgement of weaknesses in the system and strategies in place in order to deal with those, and you didn't see a board really holding the administration accountable. How would you do that? Well, I think as a board of trustees, it's our role to hold the administration accountable. Um, currently, I don't see that being done, and the role of trustees is to ask those tough questions and make sure they're getting that information. The trustees are the ones in charge. It's not the administration. And we should not be letting the admi administration run the show. Thank you, Trina. Pamela, you said you'd like to increase the con consultative capacity of the school board with stakeholders and parents. How would you do that? Thank you, Jeff. So as I indicated earlier, one of the things I recommended was that the board establish a committee. We did a tremendous amount of work last year. I found it was very productive and um, very helpful in talking with community and citizens about what it is that they expect from their public education system and where they see education going into the future. Uh, one of those things we definitely also need to include and expand, and it's a, it takes a tremendous amount of concerted effort to focus on the work of the board and not individual trustees. And so... Um, Thank you, Pamela. Yeah. Irina. You've said you'd like to see the focus put on individual students. How would you see that done? Context in which that was said was our dropout rate from high school. Um, and again, um, I think that it's not about how many of them drop out, but really whether they drop out with a foundation to succeed in life. And what I think needs to happen is maybe we need to work with trade school. Um, or other post-secondary institutions that um, so that we can make a path for these students to work towards a goal to continue on um, 13 years is awfully long we have kindergarten plus 12 years thank you arena george you stated we need to explore with various institutions the more seamless arrangements for moving from high school to post-secondary programs how would you do that <clears throat> Thank you. First of all, the, uh, there's a pretty good relationship between the, the, between the CBE and the University of Calgary. It's kind of developing between, uh, with, with uh, Mount Royal University. Uh, I, don't, I think that there's lots of opportunity for us to do more with uh, SAIT and uh, probably Alberta College of Art. So these are, these are all opportunities. And one of the things is, you know, we need to look not just at employers, Thank but you, also, also take our people in. <laughs> it is a very quick round of questions. Lori, you've said trustees need to hold the administration to account, especially when it comes to spending of taxpayer dollars. How would you do that? In 30 seconds, hey, there's the mic now. The, the quick and simple answer is make sure that budget is transparent. Uh, get it down to 80 or 100 line items. Make sure the public is behind us. Make sure that we let you know where the dollars are spending and say, yes, I have confidence that you're spending the dollars. 
Secondly, when things come to the board, when issues come to the board about spending, we have to ask those tough questions. Do we really need this? Do we really need to have this happen? Is it going to impact the classroom? Look at that. Two seconds left. Thank you, Larry. <laughs> okay, Stephen, you've, you've said that you would like to see earlier career counseling in schools. How would you do that? Well, I'll just give you a quick example of my experience in grade 12. A career counselor comes before I'm going to graduate six months. What do you want to do? I want to be an airplane pilot and travel the world. Well, here's Air Canada, $10,000, 2020 vision, and take this science. Well, I can't give you $10,000. I don't have 20. Well, join the military. And I'm just talking to people, grade 10 students who are not engaged in grade 12. And this guy was filling up my propane. And he says, yeah, I'm going to fail. But what, I, I said, didn't a career counselor come to you? Yeah, he told me I'm not going to graduate. And that was it. And all Thank you, you have uh, is career fairs and grade. Thank you, Stephen. All right. So uh, that ends the how round. Uh, we'll now go to the audience selected questions. Uh, we did get a lot of questions submitted, and that's wonderful. Uh, so the way in which we have one round of questions for this, so the way in which we've chosen them is we try to combine a few that were on the same issues uh, and those that uh, did not seem uh, to repeat the same issues that we asked in the, the original round of questions. Uh, so a few of those that had more and then I just am going to rem or randomly select a couple more. So I'd remind you, once again, your poker chips are fair game, if you still have them. Uh, you have one minute and 30 seconds to answer each of these questions. Once again, poker chips uh, give you a one minute to rebut. So the first question will go to George and Stephen. Uh, and that question is, what are your thoughts on the new report cards that are being proposed? George. I have not seen the new report cards, and um, the they have you know people uh, people think it's further down the track than it is. The the uh, I think that the inspiring education and the trends south of the border and the advancing technology is going to lead us to new uh, report cards. But there's other things that are coming along that are uh, complementary to that. So, such as the IRIS uh, program that was mentioned earlier. So it's probably coming, but the, the, uh, the notion was that there was going to be an, uh, a trial run with three new schools. Apparently now we have, we have many, many forms of report cards, and uh, they're, uh, they, they need to have some commonality to them. So I'm quite confident we'll get there, uh, but it's going to take some time. Thank you very much, George. Stephen? Um, I did not see the report cards, but I know the issue is a big problem. However, I can did a read-up on one of the graduations. Instead of saying graduated, you completed. Now, from what I read is this wording is different because there's you really didn't graduate on this letter or number system, you completed. So say if I took four years, I completed high school. Or if I was taking certain arts at a charter school, I completed my grade 12. I didn't graduate. So maybe the wording different makes you feel better, like you completed instead of graduated. So. That's my take on the new report card. I don't really know. I haven't been involved in reading up on that. Thanks. Thank you, Stephen. Trina? The report cards are probably one of the most common issues that I've heard while door knocking at thousands of doors over the past few months. A lot of people are concerned that there is a lack of accountability with report cards that do not have any comments on them, do not have any grades on them. At the end of the day, we need to remember that report cards are to report to parents and students. Teachers can use whatever assessment methods they want to assess the child in the, in the classroom and to meet their needs. But when it comes to reporting to parents and students, we need to be involving parents and students in knowing what should be on those report cards because at the end of the day, it's for them and they need to be able to understand them and find value in them. Thank you very much, Trina. Misty? 
So right now there are 26 different report cards used in our junior high schools. And uh, like George mentioned, I think it would be ben very beneficial for there to be a, uh, a common reporting system that everybody in the city can understand that if you do happen to move from school to school, there is uh, something relatable. Um, but I think along with the report cards, there is on, on the CBE's website, they state that each school will be developing their own ongoing communication system as a part of that reporting system. That's very encouraging to me because we have different demographics and parents and students with different needs and the schools can cater the ongoing, the ongoing reporting system um, along with that new report card system. So I think that looking forward, this is going to be a great thing after we have some significant and meaningful conversations with everybody involved, including parents, students, and educators. Thank you, Misty. All right, the next question we put together uh, is a bit of amalgamation on questions on communications. Uh, so this will go to Trina and Misty. Uh, the question is, essentially comes down to how would you ensure good communications from the board to all your stakeholders? Excellent. <laughs> I just finished a master's in educational technology and actually my final research project was how to involve parents and other citizens in our school system. And so I wrote a big 20 page paper on that, but I won't bother you with all of, all of that. But I found that, you know what? It really does come down to reaching people where they are. There is not going to be one single magic bullet that will reach everyone. So we need to be doing the social media work. We need to be accessible to the public whether that means by having coffee parties, having online forums where people can ask us questions, being on Twitter, being on Facebook, and making sure that we are available to our constituents. Thank you, Trina. Misty? Um, I think that full communication, unbiased communication um, is very important. And I think that we need to recognize the value that the administration of the CBE has, has provided for us and for our students, and to reflect that, to not only point out what is wrong, to not only criticize what is, is going wrong, but to encourage change and to celebrate our achievements and successes in a clear manner. Thank you very much, Misty. All right, no one wants to add in. All right, the next question will go to Larry and Irina. Uh, this is again a bit of an amalgamation of some, some questions uh, and comes down to uh, what do you think of bus fees as they currently stand? Larry. Bus fees is a big issue. Um, I'm hearing from a lot of parents a, a lot of hardships. Um, in the last three years, they've gone up quite dramatically. And if you have children, if you have more than two children, uh, a couple of years ago, they got rid of the family maximum. So I've, I've heard numbers like $1,500. Uh, parents are, are cutting a check in September for, for three kids with their fees and their busing. So we, ha we really have to look strongly at, is this a public education system or is it a paid education system? And we need to very look strongly at that value and find ways of, of, uh, of, of unburdening that hardship on them. And as well, if you live across the street from a school and we do not have room for you at that school, you should not pay for busing. It's absolutely ridiculous. People are getting charged for busing when they move in across the street from a school. I, it's scandalous. So that piece right there, for sure, has to go. And we have to find a way somewhere in the budget to make sure that that happens, at the very least, without charging others in the busing <laughs> to, 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 over comp, to compensate for that. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Irina? Larry, so concur on everything he just said. Um, also would like to make a note, for a business to spend some money to raise or some money to essentially make, make some revenue is completely appropriate. But when we're looking at fees and we are trying to raise $3 million for lunch supervision, for example, but we're spending half a million in administration costs to actually collect these fees. 
I really question whether the, whether it's valid, uh, considering that we shouldn't be charging parents for lunch supervision fees in the first place. And now we're spending money to send collection agencies after them. I'm not for that whatsoever. Thank you very much, Irina. So the next question goes to Judy and Pamela. And that is, what is your position on all day kindergarten? Judy. Having started as a kindergarten teacher, it is uh, very near and dear to my heart. And I would certainly be in support of being able to do that. Having said that, I also have to be realistic. And uh, one of the people at the front has talked about the lack of space. And so when we go to that move, we have to understand that to make that move and to make it available to all students, we'd have to really look at the space issue in the Calgary Board of Education and look at how we're going to support that. And so I think it's not as easy as just saying we're going to do this, but boy, when you look at the impact that you can make with our youngest students, and we know then that transfers for a lifetime, to me, it is one of the things that we all need to do, and we all need to look at how are we going to do that, recognizing that there are some issues to get that done. Thank you very much, Judy. Pamela? So I agree with what Judy has said. Uh, the, the importance of full-day kindergarten for our at-risk students is incredible. Um, uh, many of the schools that I represent in Wards 5 and 10 do benefit from full-day kindergarten programs. The problem that we have is that the government, our province, is not funding full-day kindergarten programs. And so the, that money to support those programs and is coming from other places. And so to me, that is the challenge. That would be the whole piece of redefining what public education is. Our communities have stated that this is a value, this is something that they treasure, and this is something that our students need to ensure that they succeed all through their school years. And so I absolutely support full-day kindergarten, uh, and the board has been very actively involved um, in advocating that with the province and with um, Alberta School Boards Association. So I believe it is a critical piece in ensuring the success of each and every student. Thank you very much, Pamela. Can I just add something else? Go ahead. So uh, the other piece is, is absolutely space, and that will be if we've got all of our kids attending full-day kindergarten, and then when the Education Act comes into effect, Sorry, and we 30 have seconds left. Our high school. <laughs> <laughs> our high school. Uh, you can use your poker chips if you wish. Yes. <laughs> it's important. It's a K-12 education system. So I believe in the importance of the full-day kindergarten, but as I was saying, with the Education Act, when it comes into effect, and students being able to attend school until they're 21, we are going to suffer an even more accommodation problem than we have at the moment. So we continue to advocate for um, our new buildings in communities where we need them, and, uh, and the uh, deferred maintenance backlog has become so incredibly, un it's, it's unimaginable exactly how we're going to solve these issues. So full day kindergarten, 100% support. Thank you, Pamela. All right, so because of the odd number of candidates here, there is one candidate who is going to answer a second question in this round to ensure everyone answers at least one, but again, it is randomly chosen, so I believe it's still fair. <laughs> Uh, so anyways, the last question will go to Steve and Pamela again, uh, and that is, uh, what is your understanding of the role of the chief superintendent in terms of their control over financial matters? Steve. The chief superintendent is basically the only employee <coughs> that the school trustees have. I mean, uh, the school trustee board hires that person and that person responds and answers to the trustees. So uh, my understanding is that the superintendent is responsible for putting forth uh, recommendations in terms of the budget, getting that information from the various schools and various departments within the organization, but ultimately uh, he or she works for the elected board of trustees and it is up to the board to start setting up what are the fiscal uh, priorities and what are the fiscal processes in which we are going to go through to ensure that the resources that we need are at uh, are, are given to the, the places that we actually need them. You know, we have a one just under a $1.2 billion budget. 
Uh, only $685 million of that actually goes towards teaching salaries and everything else. So, I mean, the, the, I guess the question really boils down to where does the other half billion dollars go to? And how is that really being allocated for the best purposes? You know, Judy alluded to that earlier in terms of, uh, you know, making sure that our schools are properly maintained and, and finding out where that money is. And, and that's probably one of the strengths that I bring to the table is that I've analyzed budgets, uh, huge budgets, and I'm very good at finding out where all the cross purposes go. Uh, I wrote a book actually on the city budget in, in terms of how that money flows. One of the things they taught me in the police department was follow the money and then you can follow what's going on, so. Thank you, Steve. Pamela? Could you repeat the question for me, Jeff? Sure. Please. What is your understanding of the role of the chief superintendent in terms of their control over financial matters? Thank you. So, uh, as Steve said, the chief superintendent is sole employee of the board. And uh, we do have superintendents. Chief superintendent has superintendents that work for, with, directly with the budget. Um, and as Steve also mentioned, I mean, uh, most of our budget goes to, towards salaries. And I believe that our chief superintendent is the educational list leader in our system and understands the needs of our students and where to best place those resources. I'm not the educational leader. I understand children, I understand families, I understand fees. But we have to have someone that is in place that can oversee our budget for sure. And so the educational decisions are the ones that I rely on our chief superintendent for, for sure. Um, there are people with finance background. And so to me, that's where, that's the role of our chief superintendent in that respect, is to oversee what's going on. The Board of Trustees oversees that. Thank you very much, Pamela. All right, so that ends our questions tonight. Uh, I'd like to ask if each of the candidates could conclude with a one-minute statement. Uh, so we began at this end of the table, so we'll start at the opposite end of the table with George Lane. Thank you. Well, first of all, uh, just to allay some, some uh, fears, we do have... Uh, six new schools in our new capital plan for the next three years in wards six and seven and four major modernizations so those are that's about a quarter of what is going uh, going to be available in the city uh, what i bring to the boardroom is an educational background uh, bachelor of commerce degree master of arts phd certified management accountant teaching experience in grades one to nine, technical institute, three different universities, educational leadership, chair of the business school, chair of business policy and environment, CEO experience, dean of Haskane School of Business, president U of C Emeritus Association, president DDRC Foundation, and entrepreneurial experience, Lane Town, Homes 4L Enterprises. Thank you, George. experience and board experience. Trina? Tonight we've heard about many specific issues and some broader ones. However, what it ultimately comes down to is this. We need to change how decisions are made at the Calgary Board of Education. We need to first figure out how a budget of over a billion dollars is being spent every year. Second, we need to have real debates about issues that matter to citizens in public and allow the public to have sufficient time to provide their input. Third, we need to acknowledge that as great as our school system are, there are some areas of weakness. And we do need to identify those weaknesses, develop strategies to deal with them, and monitor those strategies for improvement. One of my favorite quotes is from Martin Luther King Jr. And he said, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. Well, I know that the education of our kids matters to you, and it matters to me too. I have not been silent over the years, and it is time for the voices of parents, students, school staff, and citizens to be heard at the Board of Education. You can make change, Thank you, you have Trina. the opportunity to. Steve? Oh, sorry, Misty. That's OK. Um, I want to give you my top three priorities that I think uh, should be the priorities of the Board of Trustees. 
Uh, I think we need to change our perspective and recognize that we are all on the same side, and that's the side of the students. We all want them to be as successful as possible and to have as exceptional education experience as possible. Our biggest strength will be working together. Uh, I want to make sure that every student has the accesses to the resources that they need in order to excel. And I think we need to be open to trying new solutions for existing problems, be willing to experiment and grab every opportunity for a fresh perspective. Thank you very much, Missy. Steve? A trustee of the school board has two primary jobs. One is resource management, making sure that the dollars that we collect go to where they need to go. Ernest Hemingway once said that to be an effective writer, you need a bulletproof crap detector. And I think part of that is that you need to start looking at some of the fiscal sacred cows that perhaps have, have uh, propagated within the budget over the years and start questioning whether or not they need to stay there. Uh, it's called zero-based budgeting and something I believe in, that you need to start to reevaluate how you're doing things and how that is, is spending. And part of that is going after the money you know, aggressively that is earmarked for education. Like I said, you know, the $52 million uh, return to the city was just, I think, uh, ridiculous. The second one is communication. You know, I learned in the police department, you get out of your car sometimes, you walk around, you talk to people, because I don't know all the answers. In fact, no one person does, but all the people do. And it's really a question of getting people to the table and having those meetings and getting out there and talking and finding out what those answers are. Thank you, Steve. Judy? So for me, it's really important that each one of you out there and everybody that you know get involved in this process. Education underlines absolutely everything that we do. It is like the core of our existence. And so it doesn't matter to me if you're a senior, it doesn't matter to me if you have no children, and I certainly want to know about what it is that it matters to those of us who have children and grandchildren. This is our responsibility. We are a vibrant, vibrant city. And you know what? The Calgary Board of Education is a dynamic learning environment. And I am so proud to have spent 30 years of my career. And I'm so proud now to look forward to how we can make and improve and find absolutely every stone that we need to turn over so that my grandchildren and your grandchildren and the future students of Calgary Thank you, are successful. Stephen. So I know corporations have mission statements. I know schools have mission statements and coats of arms. There's a mission statement under there. So I thought I'm going to make a personal mission statement to this board of trustees. And it goes something like this. I will engage students, parents, teachers, stakeholders, and I will be committed to providing the best quality education for our children. Now, the two words, engage, engage. How are we going to engage your parents? Well, social media is great. Google's free. You can, you can have conferences from 96 people and a conference call. And commitment, commitment, that's a big word. Well, if I'm committed to being here, well, then I'm here. If I'm committed to saying what I do and do what I say, then thus comes trust. So then the word trustee is involved. So I want to be committed to everybody here to gain your trust for your allocation of your money. Thanks. Thank you, Stephen. Irina? Well, obviously you came here today because you care about education. Maybe you have children, grandchildren, what have you. Um, you're thinking you're looking for a candidate who shares your views on education. But I once again would like to remind you, you need to pick a candidate who understands that the relationship between the Board of Trustees and the superintendent needs to change. If you pick a candidate whose views you share, that candidate, if they don't change that relationship, will not be able to do anything for you. So whatever ward you're in, please look, take a closer look at your candidates and vote. And tell your friends to vote, too. Thank you, Irina. Larry? Thanks, Jeff. Um, three people at this table are going to be part of a board of trustees that elects your new chief superintendent. If you want the values of accountability, responsiveness, and transparency, 
then your choice in Ward 5 and 10 is easy. It's Larry Leach, www.larryleach.ca. I'd like to thank everybody for coming out tonight. I really appreciate the, the time and effort it took for you to come out here in the rain. Um, and those from Wards 5 and 10, it was quite a long ride. So thanks, uh, special thanks. Thanks to Jeff and all the volunteers here at Civic Camp. And uh, thank you to each and every one of these candidates for putting their names on the ballot and stepping up. I know what it means. I know how hard it is. And, uh, and I respect each and every one of you. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Pamela? Thank you, sir. I'd also like to echo my thank you just to everyone involved in pulling off these forums. It's a tremendous amount of work. Um, I believe that there are incredibly talented and committed people working to ensure the learning conditions in our classrooms are the best they can possibly be within the restraints that are replaced on them with substantial cuts year after year. Our staff continue to rise up, dig deep, and create so many wonderful learning opportunities for our kids to ensure that they are successful. I think it's important that our teachers and administrators are supported in their work, that students are supported in their learning, and there is a true partnership with parents to ensure that students' needs are met. I have been a part of the Calgary Board of Education as an active participant in the last 20 years, and it has been an honor to watch our children grow and to succeed and to work with staff and to build so many great relationships, and I have treasured absolutely every moment. Thank you. Thank you, Pamela. All right, that brings our evening to a close. I'd like to thank the candidates very much and wish you all the best on Election Day. Uh, once again, to echo some of the candidates, a big thank you to Civic Camp and the citizens who provide the questions for tonight. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank our sponsors, CBC Calgary, CJSW, Fast Forward Weekly, Metro Calgary, Calgary Sound Rentals, Calgary Roadrunners, Calgary Association of Parents and School Councils, the Alberta Teachers Association, the Students Association of Mount Royal University, the University of Calgary Students Union, the Calgary Foundation, and our host tonight, the Triwood Community Centre for their generous donations. Again, I'd like to thank all of you for coming out tonight and taking an interest in the events of the uh, public school system in Calgary. Uh, I'd like to remind you that uh, Civic Camp also hosts, uh, hosts forums for uh, all the wards for uh, the aldermanic candidates and the mayor. Uh, so check those out as well. And good night, everyone. Thank you very much for coming out on this rainy night.